Legendary Passages, Episode 73, The Gods of Atlantis Sky, Sun, and Moon, from Diodorus Siculus, Library of History Last time, we reviewed the history of Atlantis. This time, we focus more on the ancient gods born there that inspired the Greek religion. Their first king was a wise man named Uranus, who taught them laws, agriculture, astronomy, and the calendar. When he died, his people deified him as the universe made manifest. Uranus had many wives, but his most productive was named Titaea, and her eighteen sons were called the Titans. When she died, she too was made a goddess, renamed Gi. Uranus's eldest child was a daughter named Basileia, she was kind and understanding, helping to raise all forty-four of her siblings, and became known as the Great Mother. After her father's death, she was made queen, and eventually married Hyperion. They had two children, a son named Helios, and a daughter named Selene. The sons of Titaea, not wanting the sons of Hyperion to be made king over them, stabbed the boy Helios and drowned him in the river. Distraught, his sister Selene jumped from the roof, killing herself. While searching for her son's body, Basileia collapsed and had a vision of him. Helios told her not to mourn them, as men would come to call the sun Helios and call the moon Selene. Basileia wandered the land, making noise with her daughter's symbols, until one day, during a storm, she vanished from sight. Afterwards, the Atlanteans called her the goddess Cybele. Next time, we finish our history of Cybele and Atlantis. The Gods of Atlantis A Legendary Passage From Diodorus Siculus, Library of History Translated by C. H. Oldfather But since we have made mention of the Atlanteans, we believe that it will not be inappropriate in this place to recount what their myths relate about the genesis of the gods, in view of the fact that it does not differ greatly from the myths of the Greeks. Now the Atlanteans, dwelling as they do in the regions on the edge of the ocean and inhabiting a fertile territory, are reputed far to excel their neighbors in reverence toward the gods and the humanity they showed in their dealings with strangers, and the gods, they say, were born among them. And their account, they maintain, is in agreement with that of the most renowned of the Greek poets when he represents Hera as saying, For I go to see the ends of the bountiful earth, Oceanus, source of the gods, and Tethys divine, their mother. This is the account given in their myth. Their first king was Uranus, and he gathered the human beings who dwelt in scattered habitations within the shelter of a walled city and caused his subjects to cease from their lawless ways and their bestial manner of living, discovering for them the uses of cultivated fruits, how to store them up, and not a few other things which are of benefit to man. And he also subdued the larger part of the inhabited earth, in particular the regions to the west and to the north. And since he was a careful observer of the stars, he foretold many things which could take place throughout the world, for the common people he introduced the year on the basis of the movement of the sun, and the months on that of the moon, and instructed them in the seasons which recur year after year. Consequently, the masses of the people, being ignorant of the eternal arrangement of the stars and marveling at the events which were taking place as he had predicted, conceived that the man who taught such things partook of the nature of the gods, and after he had passed from among men, they accorded him immortal honors, both because of his benefactions and because of his knowledge of the stars, and then they transferred his name to the firmament of heaven, both because they thought that he had been so intimately acquainted with the risings and the settings of the stars, 
and with whatever else took place in the firmament, and because they would surpass his benefactions by the magnitude of the honors which they would show him, in that for all subsequent time they proclaimed him to be the king of the universe. To Uranus, the myth continues, were born forty-five sons from a number of wives, and of these, eighteen, it is said, were by Titeia, each of them bearing a distinct name, but all of them as a group were called, after their mother, Titans. Titeia, because she was prudent and had brought about many good deeds for the peoples, was deified after her death by those whom she had helped, and her name was changed to Gi. To Uranus were also born daughters, the two eldest of whom were by far the most renowned above all the others, and were called Basileia and Rhea, whom some also named Pandora. Of these daughters, Basileia, who was the eldest and far excelled the others in both prudence and understanding, reared all her brothers, showing them collectively a mother's kindness. Consequently, she was given the appellation of Great Mother, and after her father had been translated from among men into the circle of the gods, with the approval of the masses and of her brothers, she succeeded to the royal divinity, though she was still a maiden, and because of her exceedingly great chastity, had been unwilling to unite in marriage with any man. But later, because of her desire to leave sons who should succeed to the throne, she united in marriage with Hyperion, one of her brothers, for whom she had the greatest affection. And when there were born to her two children, Helios and Selene, who were greatly admired for both their beauty and their chastity, the brothers of Basileia, they say, being envious of her because of her happy issue of children, and fearing that Hyperion would divert the royal power to himself, committed an utterly impious deed. For entering into a conspiracy among themselves, they put Hyperion to the sword, and casting Helios, who was still in years a child, into the Eridanus River, drowned him. When this great crime came to light, Selene, who loved her brother very greatly, threw herself down from the roof. But as for his mother, while seeking his body along the river, her strength left her, and falling into a swoon, she beheld a vision in which she thought that Helios stood over her and urged her not to mourn the death of her children. For, he said, the Titans would meet the punishment which they deserve, while he and his sister would be transformed by some divine providence, into immortal natures, since that which had formerly been called the holy fire in the heavens would be called by men Helios, the sun, and that addressed as Menai would be called Selene, the moon. When she was aroused from the swoon, she recounted to the common crowd both the dream and the misfortunes which had befallen her, asking that they render to the dead honors like those accorded to the gods, and asserting that no man should thereafter touch her body. And after this she became frenzied, and seizing such of her daughter's playthings as could make a noise, she began to wander over the land, with her hair hanging free, inspired by the noise of the kettle drums and cymbals, so that those who saw her were struck with astonishment. And all men were filled with pity at her misfortune, and some were clinging to her body, when there came a mighty storm, and continuous crashes of thunder and lightning, and in the midst of this Basileia passed from sight, whereupon the crowds of people, amazed at this reversal of fortune, transferred the name and the honors of Helios and Selene to the stars of the sky, and as for their mother, they considered her to be a goddess, and erected altars to her, and imitating the incidents of her life by the pounding of the kettle drums and the clash of cymbals, they rendered unto her in this way sacrifices and all other honors.